experience. But we're going to be in John 5, and uh, we're right at the beginning of a, of a section of John that's all about the authority of Jesus. And we kind of got our first taste of this two weeks ago. We had Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge last week, so two weeks ago, uh, we kind of got our first taste of this, and then we'll kind of carry on with that uh, here today. And my hope is, as we do this, that it, that it kind of helps us get our eyes uh, on the cross and heavenward, and, and it helps us to to marvel at Jesus, the Son of God, as we do that. And if you were here last time, um, you'll remember that, that, that the Jews of this time had kind of reached their breaking point with Jesus. They were fed up with Jesus. They, they, they were done with, with Jesus, right? Um, and, and you'll remember at that point, they were to the point now where, in the book of John, they were wanting to put Jesus to death. And the reason for that is he has been challenging their, their strongly held beliefs. And he's been calling himself God, which to them was blasphemy, of course, which is uh, punishable by execution, by stoning. And so they're a little freaked out about this. And so Jesus, in turn, uh, when they, they show this concern, um, he, he addresses, he, he answers their concerns. Now, naturally, you would think at that point, then, maybe he would, he would de-escalate the situation, right? He, he would try to resolve that conflict. But no, he's going to lean into it. And he's going to kind of put the pedal to the metal here. And he's going to actually press deeper into this conflict and disagreement he's having with the religious bigwigs of his day. And so let me show you what he's, he's doing here. If, you, if you're in the book of John, chapter 5, we're going to start off in the verse 19. And, and Jesus is, is talking to like a, a mob or, or a crowd of people that are, like I said, angry at him because he's been claiming to be God. And he's confronting these long-held, strongly-held beliefs that they had, in particular, as we looked at previously, about the Sabbath. Because if you remember two weeks ago, he healed the guy on the Sabbath. And you might think, we should praise, right? Yeah, woohoo! Guy got healed. He'd been paralytic for 38 years. Yay! But no, they were angry because he healed a guy on the Sabbath, right? And so he says then, Truly, truly, I say to you that the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what the Father, or what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Now I'm going to stop there for a little second. As we read the Bible, we have to read the Bible differently than, than we read other things, right? We can't just rush right through it in order to, to check it off our, our, our daily list of things to accomplish. If that's how you're reading the Bible, you're doing it wrong. Sorry, it uh, burst your bubble if that's the case. And did you see here, as we read that little passage just now, that, that, that we just learned something about the character of our God? It says, I write these things so that you may marvel, right? You see, God wants our reverent awe. He wants us to, to, to stand in wonder and marvel at Him. He wants us to be, frankly, blown away. He's that great. He's He's that amazing, right? He, he, he's that worthy. And there's something about the nature and character of our God that uh, almost seems counterintuitive at times to us. Because cause, uh, maybe you're not like me, but I think you probably are. Uh, at times we almost feel like, 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 like God's disappointed in us so then... We're a little ashamed, and we're not worthy, and we're, we're, we're kind of we hide a little bit, you know. Don't 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 look at me, God, right? But instead, here he is. He's, he's saying, "I'm writing you that you might marvel, not that you might hide, that you might marvel and be in awe and might be blown away by who I am." 
Now verse 21. It says, For as the, the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, so that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he passes from death into life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is, is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. I want to point out a, a couple of things here. here here's, here's what we're seeing in this passage. As we read this, as, as we look at this, what we're seeing here is a perfect identity of, of will and of action between God the Father and God the Son. You see, the Father and the Son in both will and action are the same. They're one. But they themselves are not the same. The Son is not the Father, and the Father is not the Son. But in identity and in will and in action, they don't disagree. Now you're like, where's the Spirit in all this, right? Take a deep breath, Trinitarians, hold on, we'll get there, right? But the stuff is, it's, it's kind of a little bit hard for our brains, right? But Jesus says, I don't do anything that the Father isn't doing. Yet, he has given to me to do whatever I will according to his will. And you read that, uh, you know, if, if you're like me, it makes your brain a little crampy almost, right? Like, oh, what? And I'm serious. I, I study hard for this stuff, and, and I worked through this, and all week I, I labored with this passage, because as I read through it, boy, you know, it just kind of, you ever have, you're, I've got a puppy. And they look at you and they do this. Uh, that was me looking at my computer screen, trying to figure this out, just going, what? <laughs> trying to make this all make sense. But, but it's super important that we get it. Because it, it's what makes us distinctively Christian. Here's what Jesus just did. There are two realities that, that are believed with great passion in monotheistic Judaism. You know, the, the Jewish people of his day. First is that, that, that life is from God alone since the beginning, right? And second, that judgment at the end of time belongs to this very same God. God has life and God has judgment. Two passionately held beliefs by monotheistic Judaism. That's the big pillar things. Like, like what do you believe as Jews? We believe that God's given life and he's the only one who gives life, and he's done so since the beginning. And that only God and God alone, and no one and nothing and nobody else, only God judges life at the end. And as I said, Jesus is not going to de de-escalate things today. What, what, what Jesus just told this mob, this crowd, this, this, these angry people who, who were at this point wanting to kill him, because they want to kill him because he's been calling himself God, what he's just told him is that he, as the Son of Man, has been given both life and judgment. And he goes so far as to say that the Father no longer judges, but, but has given judgment to him, the Son. And, and if you're still saying, I, I don't quite get still why they want to kill Jesus. I mean, yeah, I mean, think, think what he's doing. He's, he's like, he's raising people from the dead. He's, he's feeding people. He's, he, he's driving out demons. He's doing all these cool things. He's healing the sick. They wanted to kill him because he was calling himself God. And as monotheistic Jews, they had, they had no framework in which 
to understand this. There, there, was, there was no concept that they could take this in. There is one God, and it's God the Father, and it's Him alone. And there, 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 there's no room for any other way of talking about or thinking about this. And Jesus is saying, the Father has life, but He's given me life. And, and the Father no longer judges because, because He's given all that judgment to me. And not just some judgment, if you read this. It's, he's given all judgment and all life to me as the Son. And I do the will of the Father as I see it and execute upon it. This is where I really want to dive in today. Let's look at that life. I mean, look at the range that Jesus operates here when, when it comes to life. In verse 21 he says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom He will. You see, Jesus isn't just a... The, the miracle He performed isn't just like a, a one-time deal. Jesus isn't just like a, a, a one-trick pony. I mean, it would have been amazing if like two weeks ago as we studied, it, that alone would have been amazing, right? That, that He heals a child from like 20 miles away. I mean, that, that by itself... Pretty awesome. Probably more than you're going to accomplish today, right? But then, like, like that wasn't enough, right? He, he goes and meets this guy sitting by the pool. 38 years he's been paralytic. And he heals the guy simply with some words. Get up, take up your mat. You've been healed. Right? I mean, huh? He puts in a good day's work before lunch probably. And that's amazing. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, those two things are pretty awesome. But he goes way beyond just those miracles. And he's going, no, 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 not just that. Life and judgment are mine. Forget all those other miraculous signs and things that I've been telling you about all through the book of John here. Life and judgment. And you see, life and judgment are what is unique to God. And now he says, unique to me. Because I am God. In fact, you see this even more so when you get into the judgment. Monotheistic faith, regardless of whether that's Judaism or Islam, anything that's monotheistic, they are convinced that the final judgment is one of these select privileges that only God can have. No one else can judge. No one else at the end of time but God. But Jesus just said, that judgment has been given to me. I am life, and I am also judgment. In fact, look, look at why God would do that. Look at verse 23. Why would God do this? That all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. This isn't to diminish the Father. This isn't to take anything away from the Father. But the authority of Jesus over life and judgment is given to Him that they might honor Him. Not to eclipse the Father. Not to take away from His glory. But to bring the focus on Him. And to, to bring Jesus into view so that, that you and I can understand who God is. And it's in the, the coming of the Son of Man. And it's in Jesus Christ that we begin to see the Father all the more clearly. Jesus is not diminishing or eclipsing the Father by taking this on. He's actually making God the Father more known and more knowable. It's like in Colossians. He is the 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 image, Jesus, He is the image of the invisible God, right? Do you want to know what God is like? You look at Jesus. Do you want to know how God would, would, would treat you or, or how God would interact with you or, or how God would look upon your life? Read the Gospels and see what Jesus is doing. Watch Jesus interact with people. Watch as Jesus extends grace to people. Look at who Jesus confronts. 
You can find the very heart of God by looking at Jesus. And part of what we've been covering through this Gospel of John is is John's invitation for us to believe that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, is, is truly God. And that, that life is in His name. Being moral isn't enough. We need Christ. Why? Because He's God. If you want life, it's found in Christ, is what John is saying. And it's almost like Jesus knows there's going to be a lot of opposition, right? It's kind of weird how he has that omnipotence thing going on, right? It's, duh, he's God. He's kind of got this omnipotence and all-powerful thing going. But, 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 but he knows there's going to be some issues with this, right? So he gives witnesses or, or evidences or, or, or proofs to testify to the fact that he is actually the Son of God. And as we read this passage, there were four of those, and I want to point those out to you. Look first in verse 32, and we'll see the first evidence, that the first testimony, that Jesus is God. And that first evidence is that Jesus is God came through the Holy Spirit. John 5, 32. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. See, Jesus here is, is kind of cryptically referencing the Holy Spirit in that verse. It's the Holy Spirit who has done the work of illumination that has made all of us Christians. And it's the, the Holy Spirit that, that testifies to our spirit, even right now, that you and I, all of us, if we follow Jesus, that then in that we are sons and daughters of God. And if you're, if you're like, I, I don't know how that works, right? Uh, this is how I would say that works. If you, if you have a, a desire to follow Jesus, a desire to grow in your knowledge of Him, and a, a desire to submit your life to His Lordship, regardless of how well you're doing at it, if you have those desires, I would say that is this testimony of the Spirit testifying to our spirit that we are a child of God. And on the same note, if none of that exists, if you don't desire to know Him and be in relationship with Him, I wouldn't call myself a Christian, right? If you can say, I have no plan of following Jesus, I don't love Him and I don't want to submit to Him, but yeah, I was baptized when I was seven, so I must be in, right? Sorry, that's not how it works. That's not what it means to be a Christian. And so, the Spirit does the work of illumination. And we believe Jesus is God. And then, even as we, we struggle in a fallen, broken world, the Spirit testifies to our spirit. Speaks life into us, saying, You are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. Keep your head up. You are a child of God. This painful season will not last. Keep your head up. You are a child of God. I am with you and I am for you. Now another way that we know that Jesus is God through this passage is through John the Baptist, actually. The testimony of, of John the Baptist is also one of the witnesses to Jesus' deity. But it's kind of a bit odd. As I said, this week was a little bit of a brain lockup as I, as I worked through these verses. Verse 33 says this, You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. Don't miss us. What we believe about God cannot diminish God. Here's something that happens. Sometimes us or other people, we want to say like, 
I don't believe that about God, right? We want to be selective about what we want to believe about God. But what we do and don't believe about God doesn't make God any less God. It's that temptation to say, well, I don't believe God would act like that, right? And do you think God up in heaven is like, oh, well, he doesn't think I'd act like that, so, oh gosh, you know, let me, let me shrink myself a little bit so I won't be like that. In response to our, our wants and desires of who God is, it's not how God acts. What you ultimately believe about God has much impact on you, but it doesn't affect God. It doesn't affect God's godness in any sort of way. God cannot be defined by us. God is God. And the testimony of John, uh, in that, Jesus is, is, is praising while also laying out there at the same time. He's saying, I like John's validation, but I'm not validated by man. Right? He's saying, good job, John, in validating that I'm God, but... I really don't need you to validate that I'm God because I'm God. I don't need you to define me because I am God, but good job doing it anyhow. I, so I, again, kind of this cognitive thing going on. He's saying my deity isn't, isn't validated by John, yet John is this burning and shining lamp. And I, and I think why he says that is within that, our testimony does matter. But without the power of the Holy Spirit in it and through it, our testimony is just a story. But the, the, the power of the Holy Spirit and through the power of the Holy Spirit, it, it can and does use our stories to reach other people as John was used. And it testifies to God being God and that Jesus is God. And the third way in this passage that we see Jesus as God is through his miracles, right? For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And we know at this point, Jesus' ministry is, is marked by all these miraculous signs, right? Signs and wonders. Water into wine. Healing all kinds of people. All sorts of things going on in his ministry. And then back in, in chapter 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus in, in kind of the middle of the night. He comes kind of as, uh, he, he, he's one of these big religious guys, right? One of the important leaders of Jewish people. And he comes to Jesus and he says, We know that you are from God. For, for how could a man... Do the things that, are your, that you're obviously doing if God hasn't sent him. And Jesus here is now is referencing that he has authority over everything. Over, over life, over death, over judgment, over weather, over the natural order, over sickness, over, over demons. Jesus is the ultimate authority. And, and, and he's going to show that again and again and over and over. And in fact, next week Jesus is going to take... Take, take, take a kid's lunch and, and feed 5,000 people with it. And then, like, that wasn't enough, right? He's, he's going to go for a jog across the sea. Right? And we're not talking Minnesota in the middle of winter. And this is important to know, because even though Jesus is using this as evidence that he is not just a prophet, remember, because they came and said, Are, are you Elijah? Are you a prophet? Who are you, right? And he's not using this to show that he's just, just a prophet, not just a prophet, but he's using this to show that he is truly God. And he, he views these miraculous signs as, as less than the fact that he has life and judgment in his hands. The miracles attest to him, but it's the life and judgment that really speak to his authority. I mean, because if you look at things, you know, look at Elijah, or you look at Moses, I mean, these guys also performed some pretty impressive things, right? Moses, remember, he had the stick. That was a snake. It's a stick. It's a snake. It's a stick. What's going on here? Right? Moses walks up to a lake and goes, woo! Pretty cool. Nice party trick. 
right? I saw, there was a cartoon came through my Facebook feed this week and, and Moses and another guy were fishing and his, his buddy had his rod in the water and the water was parted where his bait was. <laughs> he said, Moses, knock it off. <laughs> but, so, so there are other things in the Bible that were miraculous. And in fact, some demonic things that were miraculously recorded in the Bible. So, so, so Jesus is saying, these miracles are great, but they're not the be-all, end-all of attesting that I am God. It's that I have life and that I have judgment that speak fully to my deity. Speak to the fact that he has ultimate authority. And then from this passage, kind of the fourth and, and final way that I want to point out today that, that speaks about how Jesus is God is the Bible itself. The last witness to his deity that is in this passage is found in verse 37. And I think it's a pertinent passage. Let's look at this. It says in verse 37, And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one in whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you will have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me. Yet, you refuse to come to me that you may have eternal life. The, the last evidence of Jesus' deity that he lays out before this crowd, because remember there's a crowd, they're angry with him, they, they want to kill him, they want him to die. This last evidence that he lays out there before this angry, angry crowd is the scriptures themselves. They think they know the scriptures, right? They're Jews. They think that they are experts on what is found within the words of, of Scripture. Yet, they didn't find Jesus there. Frankly, this is still a problem today. Too often, too frequently, people read the Bible to know about the Bible. That's not what this is about. The Bible is about Jesus and God's relationship with us. If reading the Bible doesn't bring you into a deeper relationship with Christ, then you've wasted your time. Reading our Bible is to be worship and fellowship with the living God. It is to make us marvel about Him. To stand and in reverent awe of God, the creator of the universe, the one who loved us so much that he sent his one and only son, the one who, who looks down upon us if we have Jesus in our lives and doesn't see us as sinners but sees us as saints washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. It's that God, as we read the Bible, that we need to marvel and have this reverent awe to bow down before him. That's why we read the Bible. If it is just for head knowledge and not heart knowledge, then you've missed Jesus and you've missed the point. And when the church is ignorant of the book, they're ignorant of Jesus. And when they're ignorant of Jesus, the church is weak and frail and afraid. And the more we know the Bible, the more we see Jesus in the Bible, the more we are in awe, the more we are in wonderment of His greatness, the more our courage increases, the more our boldness becomes a reality, and the more life there is to be had for us in Christ. And, and, and I want to highlight this. Because in this day and age, in this time in which we live, it is clear that biblical illiteracy is rampant. What we are looking for oftentimes is a, is a quick, short way to be full of life in Christ without actually knowing exactly who He is, right? I want some Jesus, but I don't want to put in the effort to have a relationship, right? We do that in our hookup culture, don't we? I want a lady, but I don't want to put in the effort to have a relationship with her. 
I like boys, but relationships are work. So can I get my needs met without having to have a relationship? How can I get from this point to that point the fastest way possible, right? People do that spiritually too. And I just wonder sometimes if this is why uh, the, the reasons that people have a hard time studying their Bible. It's because they're looking for a quick fix. They're, they think the Bible is about the Bible and they think they're just going there for answers. But there's more than that. There's relationship. There is love. There is awe. There is wonder. Let me just learn the Bible because it's the Bible, right? Let me just study it like it's some textbook about science or history or some other book you might pick up out of the library, right? But that's not why we read the Bible. We learn the Bible because the Bible is about Jesus. And in fact, he's going to go so far as to say this for me. I don't even have to say it. He, Jesus really turns up the heat here. Look at verses 45 and 46. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you already. Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe in me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now here Moses means the law, right? The Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Books written by Moses. First five books of the Bible. And the law is written about me, the Christ, the Son of God. And if you will not believe the words of Moses, who is your guy, right? Moses is your dude. He is the, the one you put up on the, on the pinnacle of the Mount Rushmore of, uh, of people of faith. And if you won't believe what he says about me, there's no way you're going to believe my words. And, and, and this is, Jesus, like I said, Jesus is putting the pedal to the metal here, full-on confrontation with these people who are already angry at him. And he's confronting them because they're using the Bible for something other than learning how to know and love and worship Jesus Christ as Lord. And if we too aren't careful... We can accumulate biblical knowledge without the end goal being relationship with Christ. And if that is the case, if it's just that head knowledge, and it's not heart knowledge, we end up being far less than God intends us to be. Now don't hear me saying anything, anything at all disparaging about the Word of God. That's not what I'm saying. The problem these people had was that they, they thought that they knew the book without actually using it. And this is Jesus' confrontation of that. Jesus is in fact saying to them, you're actually using the Bible to hide from me. You're using the Bible to avoid me. You're like, what? You study the scriptures and bang. You think you have life in them, yet those scriptures are telling you that life is found in me, not in those words. The scriptures are, are proof that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that life is found only in Him. Life is found in Jesus. There's a lot of things that try to take its place, right? We think we can find life in a lot of other things. Nicer cars, nicer clothes, nicer boats, bigger houses... We can't, though. That's a false god. We, we, we think more money can save us. But it can't. That's a false god. We think a relationship or many other things can fix us and make us happy. They can give us life. But they can't. No man, no woman, no child, no money, no power or authority, no thing can give you life. Life is found in Christ, and it's the only place that it is found. And sometimes that feels counterintuitive. Sometimes, as we surrender to Jesus, it can feel like death. Eh, can we just be real for a minute? Laying down the things of this world can be hard, because they can get a grip on our hearts. 
We want that boy to like us. We want that truck that looks awesome. We want that security of the money in the bank. We want the the control of that situation. And instead, surrender. Surrendering to Jesus can be scary and difficult. Following Christ is dying to yourself and letting Christ be at the center and be in control. We say, here Jesus, take the wheel. But then we don't let go of it, right? We keep holding on. The path for spiritual maturity is giving that up. Leaning on and then learning to trust in Christ. Following Christ is dying to yourself and it's self-sacrifice. It's being, being willing to be confronted a million times between here and when we go to glory. Knowing that, that God is for you and not against you, but in that He's going to expose some things in you again and again and again. But when He picks at those scabs in our lives, instead of pressing down on them, He heals them with grace. He brings us His steadfast love. We're met with kindness over and over again. That should make us marvel that God comes to us, heals us, chases after us and pursues us when we're not even after Him, continues to love us abundantly, endlessly, over and over and over again. Because life is found in Christ. And it's the only place that it can be found. Because Jesus is God. Amen? Let's pray. Father God, I I thank you for these men and these women. I thank you for this text. I thank you that this is about you, Jesus. And that in you we find life. And in you there is judgment. And in you there is hope so that we can turn to you and put our eyes on you and just ask that you would help us increase in our faith and and that in our hearts we would grow with affection for you. God, I pray this week that you would restore our awe, that you would restore our wonderment, that we would see beauty again in you. So often, God, we are just half-hearted creatures. And and for so many of us, God, Christianity is just kind of like an add-on into our lives. We set it aside like we set aside one of our hobbies and pick it up again whenever we want to. But God, that can't be. We're in or we're out. There is no lukewarm. And so, God, I just pray this week that you would show your glory your abundant majesty, that we may just stand stupefied and in awe and wonder of your greatness and your love for us through your Son, Jesus. God, I ask for your mercy in that. God, I pray that we would repent of, of the times where we don't put you first, where we don't trust you, where we try to put other things in your place and put our hope and trust in them. God, we repent of that. And God, as you, as you take over those places in our hearts, as you push out the old, as you, as you dig out those deeply rooted sins in our lives, give us your wisdom to set those things free. Help us to grow beyond it. Help us to see that you truly bring us life. Bring us life this week, that we might know you more, God. And as we know you more, Help us to share you more. Help us to share your love wherever you might send us. We thank you in the beautiful name of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.